Do you need another? Do you need a packet? They're up there. Yep. There you go. Um, the reason why we, we think that it was Jeremiah or um, we think that it was Jeremiah or Ezekiel is because the last king in talked about in the book of Kings is Zedekiah, and Zedekiah is the last king of Israel. So in other words, the entirety of all of the kings had occurred when this book was written. That's why we believe it's this time frame. Keep in mind, on a timeline, you're in the 900s here, and then the Babylonian captivity is in the 500s. There's a 400-year gap. So this history book is being written long after the, the fact that it happened. Okay? Um, it covers approximately about 120 years of history. All right, 1 Kings. In the first half of the book of Kings, we will see Solomon, who is the son of David, and uh, the David and Bathsheba, come to the throne at the death of King David. This is going to set into motion the <coughs> error of the kings of Israel. Um, Saul, Saul is looked at sort of as an oddity. He's, he, 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 he actually is the first king of Israel, but he's in a realm all of his own. This time in Israel's history will last for over 400 years as they're going to go through 42 kings and one queen. I don't know if you knew that. Sadly, most of their kings are going to be evil and their kings are going to lead the people to destruction. Main characters in 1 Kings. The most important characters in this half of the book are Solomon, who was the son of David, Rehoboam, who was the son of Solomon, Jeroboam, who is a successful general in the army of Solomon, and Elijah, who is the prophet of God. If you need to, keep those out so that you can look at them and not get confused. Um, that's a good way to do it. Solomon. When King David is old and near his death, there seems to be some confusion about which of his sons would succeed him. At the urging of Bathsheba, who is Solomon's mother, David agrees to fulfill a previous promise to place Solomon on the throne. The confusing part about that is it's not in Scripture. We don't read about that previous promise, but it's discussed. Bathsheba says, you, you said that Solomon was going to come to the throne, and David says, yes, I did. But we don't have a history of that. We're just taking it from what they say. Uh, Solomon, whose name comes from the root word shalom, or peaceable, begins with his eyes focused on doing God's will. Let me stop there for just a minute. Um, oh, no, it's down here at the bottom. I'm not going to stop. I'm going to keep going. All right. Um, he, he, when God appears to him in a dream, to, uh, it, when God appears to him in a dream, I don't know what that means, to ask, as allows him to ask for blessing, that's weird. Solomon chooses wisdom in order to, and here's what Solomon says, Give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? So what I was trying to say very clumsily there is God allows Solomon a choice. He says, choose what you will. And Solomon comes back and says, I need to know how to lead these people uh, with a discerning heart, how to, how to have wisdom, how to govern well. God is very pleased with this request, and he promises to give him victory from all of his enemies, wealth and honor, as well as great wisdom. People are, will come from all the nations all over the known land to seek counsel of King Solomon. Solomon certainly lives up to the name that is given him by God in 2 Samuel chapter 12. Nathan the prophet comes to tell David that God has named the child Jedidiah which means beloved of the Lord. Solomon begins his reign under the blessing of a beloved son of God. That's such an interesting story. So Bathsheba and David call him Solomon, uh, 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 the root word of shalom. Remember the, um, the uh, child that has died, and then when Solomon is, when God allows Bathsheba to have another child, she has Solomon. And there's now peace with God between David and God. Because David has repented 
for the sin of what previously happened. And so this team, there is now peace in the relationship between God and David. So it's a beautiful name. But God sends the prophet Nathan to David and Bathsheba and says, I have named this child Jedediah, which means beloved of God. Letting David and Bathsheba know this one I love. This one I will be with. This one has my blessing. Is, is Solomon ever called Jedediah in the Bible? He and God have that name. But he's never called Jedediah in Scripture. Isn't that interesting? All right, Solomon is well known in history for two primary reasons. One, he's the wisest man ever known, and he is the man who will build the great glorious temple of God. His father, David, had desired to build a house for the Lord, but was told in 1 Chronicles 22, 8, but this word of the Lord came to me. You have shed much blood and have fought many wars. You are not to build a house for my name because you have shed much blood earth in my sight. So when David wanted to build the temple, this was what the Lord came back and said, no David, you have shed too much blood. My house is to be a house of peace. And so it won't be David. God desired that his house be a house of peace, a house of praise for all nations. Who better to do that than a man whose very name meant peace? However, the more material possessions that Solomon was able to accumulate, the easier it was for him to step out of the provision of the Lord. Solomon accrued a massive stable of horses. He had over a thousand wives and concubines. Not very wise for a wise man. That was not wise. He had a great palace for himself. And he had a separate palace for at least some of his wives. One of his first wives is the, is the Pharaoh's daughter. He marries Pharaoh's daughter in Egypt to create a peace alliance between Egypt and Israel. And he builds her a, her own palace, but he doesn't build it in the, in the city limits. He builds her outside of the city limits. He builds her a great uh, palace. With no lack in his life, and apparently too much time on his hands, Solomon allowed his wives, who came from Egypt, look at all these places that he's getting wives from, Moab, Ammon, Edom, Sidon, and the Hittites, and they were, they were allowed to bring in and worship their idols. They were from the nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites. You must not intermarry with them, because they will surely turn your hearts after their God. <clears throat> Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. That's chapter 11, too. So he brings them in, and he doesn't set the stipulation of, my God will be your God. As the king, as the husband, he certainly had every right to do that. But I think with a thousand of them, they keep you kind of on your toes. <laughs> and he just pretty much goes, whatever you do, you do. <laughs> So he set no boundaries. He set no guidelines. We see that with David and his children, and it turned out horrible. Now Solomon is doing the same thing with his wives. Solomon even consented to build temples and altars for them to use in worship. This was blasphemy, and this was idol worship, something that God had warned his people that they were never to do. So as Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father had been. Chapter 11. So look what turned the wisest man ever known. Idol worship. Took his eyes off of God. You can have all of this that you can accumulate go to the finest of schools and have a photographic memory and know everything there is to know. But if your eyes are not focused, if he is not guiding every step that you take, you are a fool. And Solomon ends up this, takes this great blessing that God gives him of being the wisest man ever and becomes a great fool because of how much he chooses to do that. 
Because of this great disobedience, the Lord proclaimed a judgment on Solomon, just as he had already told them he would do. So the Lord said to Solomon, since this is your attitude, and you have not kept my covenant and my decrees, which I commanded you, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you, and I will give it to one of your subordinates. Nevertheless, for the sake of David, your father, I will not do it during your lifetime. I will tear it out of the hand of your son. Yet I will not tear the whole kingdom from him, but I will give him one tribe for the sake of David, my servant, and for the sake of Jerusalem which I have chosen. That is an important scripture to, to remember. Let's go, let, just keep it in your mind as we go forward. Solomon was around the age of 60 when he dies of natural causes with that many women, wives. <laughs> he will have ruled and reigned in Israel for 40 years. At his death, things began to unravel very quickly. At first, it is assumed that Solomon's son, Rehoboam, will be his successor. However, here's the story. The people come to him and they ask for some relief for the tremendous burden of taxes that had been implemented by his father Solomon. Solomon put a great deal of tax on the people. That's how he paid for a lot of the stuff that he had. Instead, Rehoboam tells them he is even bigger, stronger, and tougher than his father, so he is going to put an even larger tax burden. He says it in the funniest way. Let me think if I can get this right, if I remember it. He says, my, my finger is thicker than my father's waist. <laughs> in other words, I'm bigger and stronger than my dad ever was. And so you think you had it bad with him? Look what I can do. The people quickly rebel and cry out for Jeroboam, who was, now remember your list, the previous general of Solomon who had been told by the Lord earlier in a dream that he would be given ten parts of the nation. Who would like to read this one? Raise your hand. Hello. I will take the kingdom from his son's hand and give, it, give you ten tribes. I will give one tribe to his son so that David, my servant, may always have a lamp before me in Jerusalem, the city where I choose to However, as for you, I will take you, and you will rule over all your heart's desires. You will be king over Israel. If you do whatever I command you, and walk in obedience to me, and do what is right in my eyes by obeying my decrees and commands, as David my servant did, I will be with you. I will build you a dynasty as enduring as the one I built for David, and give it and will give Israel to you. I will humble David's descendants because of this, but not forever. Okay, so this is Jeroboam, who is not the son of Solomon, but a general. And look what God tells him. He says, I'm going to give you ten tribes out of those twelve tribes. No, not all of them, but I am going to give you ten of those. Now, I'm going to do this amazing thing for you, although you are in, not, in the, not in the line of succession and really have no right to this. I am going to do this, and I'm going to ask one thing out of you. What's he going to ask? Be obedient. He gives Solomon all the wisdom in the world, riches, great wealth, and fame, and he says, I'm going to ask one thing out of you, Solomon. Be obedient. That's all that he asks these guys to do. And so he gives this great gift to Jeroboam, who is going to become one of the most evil men in the history of Israel. All he says is, obey what I have laid out. So now, the nation that had been unified under King David and flourished in wealth under King Solomon will begin the great civil war that will last for the next 400 years. You need to know that the only time Israel is unified, strong, at the pinnacle of everything, is under the reign of David and Solomon. That's when they're unified. That's when everything is good. After the death of Solomon, because of what he had done with the idols, the kingdom is going to be ripped out of his son's hand, and it's going to go, ten, ten of the tribes are going to go to Jeroboam, all except for one tribe, and we're going to get to that part of the story. But the reason that that's done is because of what Solomon did.
Okay, so you're following that line there. And then um, now there is going to be great division between all of these tribes. Never again will these tribes be unified. <coughs> Never again will they have the strength <coughs> of standing together. All right, so a kingdom divided. Ten of the tribes, you can read those here, are going to follow Jeroboam. And they are going to make him their new king. Why do they want Jeroboam? Because Rehoboam has just told them, I'm going to tax you to death. And they said, give us someone else. And they remember Jeroboam. He's a good leader. He's strong. Bring him in. For the rest of the Old Testament history, this group will be known as the Northern Kingdom. So I am going to put Jeroboam here. Jeroboam broken half, northern kingdom. The northern kingdom for the remainder of history in the Old Testament is simply called Israel. Very confusing, right? Because Israel can be the nation. Israel was the name of Jacob. Uh, oftentimes it's discussed. But this is what it will be known as, is it will be known as Israel. This is going to be 10 tribes. Look on this map that I've included in here to get a visual of what I'm talking about. Right here, this colored map. The green land is the northern kingdom. <clears throat> okay, now, let's follow through and go through the rest of this. Sorry. The tribe of Judah is going to follow after the kingship of Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. They are going to be known as the southern kingdom, or for the rest of scripture, they'll be known as Judah. Later, the tribe of Benjamin is going to merge with them. So, Rehoboam, he's the actual son. He is going to be known as southern kingdom in the Bible. And when they talk about them by name, they will call them Judah. Remember, that's one of the tribes. In fact, that's the tribe of the kings. And they stay in Jerusalem. The northern kingdom, or Israel, will now separate themselves from their brothers of the other tribe. Now, here's where it gets really dicey for Jeroboam. Jeroboam begins to fear that if the people are free to travel to Jerusalem to worship, which is where they were supposed to go, at the, because uh, where's the temple? in Jerusalem, and that's where they were to go. He's afraid that if they go there, they may, be, they may stay. They may want to just stay there. And so, Jeroboam does the unthinkable. He builds two golden calves. All right? Now look, after seeking advice, the king made two golden calves. He said to the people, oh, it's too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, Israel, who brought you out of Egypt. One he set up in Bethel and the other in Dan. You can look on your map and find one at the top, one at the bottom. He's, he covers all the bases. And this thing became a sin. The people came to worship the one at Bethel, and then they went as far as Dan to worship the other one. Jeroboam, Jeroboam built shrines on high places, and he appointed priests from all sorts of people, even those who were not Levites. Look what he's done. This will be known as the sin of Jeroboam. And over and over and over and over and over in scripture, you will hear that discussed. That it will, it will, it will be called the sin of Jeroboam. And this is what they're talking about. The sin of idolatry. He took the ten, the ten tribes and they became a whole different religion. All right, now, the people were encouraged to set their own appointed feasts rather than those feasts of the Lord that we studied about in the book of Leviticus. They worshipped and they sacrificed to the golden calves rather than worshipping and sacrificing to the one true God of Israel. The city of Samaria is going to become their capital. So these guys are going to get Samaria. And these guys are going to get Jerusalem as their capital. Now, here's what's interesting. So, they're divided, and Samaria becomes their capital. Later on, where I'm jumping ahead, but later on they're going to be dispersed into the nations because the Assyrians are going to come and run them off. 
God sends the Assyrians as judgment. When they do, they go out and they merge with the other nations wherever they're at. They become half Jew, half whatever else they're in. This is where the Samaritans come from that we read about, that are so hated in the New Testament that there's no respect for them in the New Testament, where everyone talks about them as if they're dogs. They're known as half-breeds, half-Jew, half-pagan. And these guys never forgive them for that. So even in the New Testament, when we see Samaritans, this is where it's going to begin. Right? That's just a little jumping ahead timeline, but you need to know that's where this is headed. Prophets will be sent. From this point on, every prophet that will come to speak to the people for God will either come specifically to the northern kingdom or to the southern kingdom. These messages are an attempt to turn them from their disobedience before judgment hits. However, ultimately, each of the two tri uh, kingdoms are going to succumb to their sins, and they will ultimately be destroyed. These guys are going to last about 150 years longer than these guys, but both of them are going to fall. We're jumping ahead in that. What you need to know in this section is when we start going through all those major and minor prophets that we're going to hit as we go through our study, every one of them is sent specifically either to these guys or to these guys. They don't go into both. They're, they're either here or they're either here, and it's the same message. Turn from your sin so that I don't have to destroy you. Nobody was successful because they're not, they're not, not listening to the prophets. They're not listening to God. They don't want to turn. They want to continue to live in their sin. Yes, ma'am. Um, I see the ten tribes of, that go to the north, and you said one tribe is in the south. Benjamin is going Benjamin is going to merge with them and so you're going to see Judah and Benjamin, and Benjamin. merging together. Oh, but, right there. Yeah. All right. So um, the northern kingdom is going to fall to the, I told you that to the Assyrians in about 722. So they get about oh roughly 180 years of prophets coming to them. They're going to be killed, they're going to be taken into slavery, and they're going to be dispersed into the nations of the surrounding countries. The ten tribes are going to marry, and they're going to weave into the fabric of the people of the land wherever they get sent to. Eventually, their Jewish culture, their customs, and their religions are going to be blended with the pagan people. Again, that's where the Samaritans are going to come from. The southern kingdom, or Judah, is going to last about 140 years longer than the northern kingdom. But they are also going to end up falling, even though they get a lot of prophets who come to them and beg them to turn back to God. They are going to fall to the Babylonians this time through Nebuchadnezzar. And that's our story of Daniel. We read all about that when we get to Daniel. Um, Solomon's glorious temple is going to be destroyed when Nebuchadnezzar comes. And all those items of great wealth that Solomon had accumulated and taxed his people for are going to be taken by Babylon, and they're going to be stuck in a, in a temple in Babylon. When you say that the prophets are sent first to the north and then to the south. Mm -mm. No, they're <coughs> either sent to the north right. or the south. Right. Not so, both. Right. So do those prophets come from, like the prophet that's sent to the north, comes from the north, the prophet that's sent Good question. The south. You're going to you're going to find this very interesting when we get to the study. There's a mix. Okay. Sometimes these guys are sent here, these guys are sent here. Sometimes it comes from their own people. God uses every way that he can to reach these people. And sometimes they don't even want to go because it's not their people. <laughs> and these guys don't like these guys and these guys don't like these guys and sometimes they don't even want to go and God sends them. So he uses all of them. And that's going to be the interesting part as we weave together all of our prophets, is that you're going to see how they fit into all of that. But they all have exactly the same job. The job is to go here and tell these guys, or go here and tell these guys to shape up, or you're going to be destroyed. Now, Elijah is going to be the big prophet that we meet in 1 Kings. He lives in the northern kingdom, this one, here. And prophesies 
to those ten tribes. Elijah takes over the position that Samuel first held in leading the school of prophets. He will attempt to bring the people to repentance, but they are a stubborn people, and they refuse to give up their Baal worship, that, uh, the idols. Only a very small remnant of the people do not fall into idolatry. The priests and the prophets of the Lord are put to death, particularly by the wicked queen Jezebel. Oh, that's such an interesting story if you get a chance to read it. She is a bad, bad lady. And she kills all but a hundred of the prophets of God and try, as she's trying to uh, have them worship after Baal. And uh, the priests and the prophets of the Lord, oh yeah, I got that. God will use Elijah to perform miracles such as raising the dead, bringing rain where there is drought, parting of the river, and bringing fire from heaven. Elijah will be fed by ravens. He's going to be fed by an angel. And despite all of those miraculous events, the majority of the people in the northern kingdom do not want to hear his words from the Lord. And instead, they try and take Elijah's life. Finally, God will provide a fiery chariot that takes Elijah to heaven while he is still alive. It's the first rapture of the believer. So, in chapter 18, Elijah will have a firefight between the priests of Baal and the true priest of the Lord. Of course, God wins the battle, and many of the priests of Baal are killed. Some of the people will fearfully repent, but again, it only lasts for a brief time. I love the story about Elijah of the gentle whisper of the mountain. I, every time I read it, it just takes my breath away. Jezebel threatened Elijah for killing the prophets of Baal. She says, now Ahab told Jezebel everything that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets of Baal with the sword. So Jezebel sent a message to Elijah and said, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not take your life like that of one of them. Well, Elijah was afraid, and so he runs for his life. He's hiding in a cave, and the Lord comes to him, and he says, What are you doing here, Elijah? He says, Well, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant. They've torn down your altars. They've put your prophets to death, death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now... They are trying to kill me, too. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. <laughs> then a great and a powerful wind tore the mountain apart, and it shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, there came a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and he went out. And he stood at the mouth of the cave. And the voice said to him, What are you doing, Elijah? I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all of whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and whose mouth have not kissed him. Don't you love that? God wasn't in all the fanfare this time. Conclusion. A new era for Israel has begun. From the very first book and the very first chapters, God realized that mankind is going to fail. So his promise of a redeemer begins in Genesis 3. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. The first promise of a redeemer. God gives that promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. A promised seed, he tells them. A redeemer. We see God send Moses to redeem Israel from slavery. We see God send Joshua to redeem the land for the people. We see God raise up men and women to redeem or deliver the people from themselves. We see God move the heart of Boaz 
to redeem Naomi and Ruth from despair and poverty. We see God give the people the king they think will redeem them. Ah, but we see God give the people the man who will become the greatest king for Israel, a portrait of a redeemer. In the book of Kings, we see God send prophets and priests, a faithful remnant of true believers, and a few good kings who show the people that redemption will come for those who long for it. It is that scarlet thread of redemption. It is promised from the very beginning. And there are portraits visible over and over throughout the thousands of years of scripture. It is the chesed of God, his faithful, unrelenting mercy and grace will never fail the people, even though the people fail their God. All right, so this week, look at some of the charts that will help you get some more information. The second one is a list of all of the kings. This group over here, they didn't get one good king. Not one. This group over here got a handful. Wasn't a good time for them. You can look at uh, some of that and then uh, that map. Check out that map. All right. There you go. That's a lot of information. But you know what? Let me just tell you this. This history lesson, I wish it was taught to every single person who ever attended a church. Because if you know this, it's going to make the rest of the stories make so much more sense. So it's a really good thing for you to sort of get in your mind about how that all works. Because everything, even into the New Testament, has bearing on knowing these two things. Right. All right, let me pray for us, and I'll hand out your questions. And ladies, let me pray for us. Thank you. 
Right. 